Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this afternoon for a happy hour with Plume. We're celebrating our 10th Plume 10, the anthology. And uh, Danny Lawless had this really wonderful idea to pair poets that have been published in Plume and that are are um, that we're all kind of familiar with with some another poet that maybe we haven't had the pleasure of meeting or knowing their work. So thank you so much. And of course, Writer Center, thank you so much for hosting us. And thank you to Leah Mehta for arranging this collaboration a year ago. So we're really thrilled to be here. And the way it goes is I'll introduce the first reader and introduce you to their bio and then They'll read their poem and then introduce the person that they brought on. Brought on. So um, also, I'd like to have Danny Lawless, our editor, say a few words before we get started. Thank you, Nancy. A very few words. I'm a, a man of reticence in these cases, but I will say I want to thank everyone, all of the readers, of course, and Nancy and and Leah and Amanda for moderating and the Writer Center. Everybody's been just terrific to us. Um, I too will show a copy of the, of the anthology um, designed by Chris Weber, who is just wonderful. Uh, so each one is kind of an iteration on the last, hoping that um, readers will get to know or the look of the covers as they appear. Uh, and the other thing that I have done is placed in the chat um, a link to our site so that if you wish to purchase a copy, uh, we have some pretty good deals too at this point. So they uh, that appears in the chat. It'll take you to our website and to the anthology subheading. So I don't want to take up anyone's time. The I'm ready for some poetry. So back to you, Nancy, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Danny. That's great. Um, also, I want to thank all of our plume cohorts that are here and everyone works really hard to make plume be, I think, uh, the wonderful, wonderful uh, publication it is. And I want to introduce Kelly Aganand, uh, who is a wonderful like uh, Martha as well. And I'm sure these new poets that we're going to meet is a wonderful poet citizen as well as a terrific poet. And um, she has, you know, works uh, with uh, the community in many, many ways. She's the co-founder of Two Sylvia's Press and serves on the poet fact poetry fact faculty of Rainier Writing Workshop, a low residency MFA at Pacific Lutheran University, and also her newest book, Dialogues with Rising Tides by Copper Canyon Press, is fabulous. And she's just a terrific poet. And I met her during the pandemic, the first dark um, months of the pandemic, when we thought it was just going to be a passing thing on my Poets on the Plaza reading series that the city of Salisbury hosted for me. And I've just been in love with her since. So as they say, without further ado, Kelly. Thank you, Nancy. That was um, just a beautiful intro. I really appreciate that. So I'm reading my plume poem and then I'm reading other poems. Is that correct? Read a few. Okay. OK, um, thank you all for coming out on this Saturday before Halloween. Um, I'm thrilled that you're going to hear my friend. Um, Katrina Cameron <laughs> Canyon, um, because she's who I'm paired with. And what I love about our poems is that they're about desire. And so I'm thrilled um, to be re reading with Katrina. Um, so I'm going to read the plume poem first and go from there. It's called The Rivers Are Flooding and I Am Thinking About Desire. Today I recited the blackbirds, put their afternoon alarm on a loop and waved to the hourglass lilies, reminding me that this is as young as I'll ever be. Yes, your fingers are on me. Yes, you think I'm as dark as blossoms, 
but there is no explaining. I am the ink in your favorite pen, and I like having you here, sleeping on a couch of paper and books. Sometimes you try to correct my typos, my catastrophes where the messy hour is fresh water touching salt water. And yes, the rain keeps apologizing to what spills over, but the queen blossoms are floating and ready. Hold my shady halo and invite yourself to my side. We can try to bail out the landscape with coffee spoons. We're poets who unpunctuate the forest. We have our erasers ready, though we know we'll never be able to correct the world. That's the first time I've ever read that. So thank you for being open to it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be re I'm a little nervous because I, I got paired with really great poets today. So um, I'm hoping to do my best. Okay, so I am reading from Dialogues with Rising Tides. I went to a reading the other night and I didn't even mention that this is my new book. So I'm trying to be better about that. But um, it now has a sticker for a finalist, which is what you want your book to have if it can get it as a sticker. Um, so I'm going to read the first poem in here. And I'm reading this um, because Katrina's poem is called Craving, and this poem is called Hunger. And it's the first poem in Dialogues with Rising Tides. Hunger. If we never have enough love, we have more than most. We have lost dogs in the neighborhood and wild coyotes. And sometimes, we can't tell them apart. Sometimes we don't want to. Once I brought home a coyote and told my lover that we had a new pet until it ate our chickens, until it ate our chickens, our ducks, and our cat. Sometimes we make mistakes and call them coincidences. We hold open the door, then wonder how the stranger ended up in our home. There's a woman on our block who thinks she's feeding bunnies, but they are large rats without tails. Remember the farmer's wife? Remember the carving knife? We are all trying to change what we fear into something beautiful. But even rats need to eat. Even rats and coyotes and the bones on the trail could be the bones on our plate. I ordered Cornish hen. I ordered duck. Sometimes love hurts. Sometimes the lost dog doesn't need to be found. Normally when I read that, I start that no animals think you were, were harmed in the making of that poem. Um, I just have a dark sense of humor. I don't read this poem a lot. I'm not sure why, but um, it is about desire and it's about um, the complexities of wanting to love more than one person or to have feeling that desire of that. It's called Perhaps If We Understood Desire. It's early and what I found, what we love is sometimes silenced by what we also love. Not because the moon is the problem, but because two moons are. A galaxy dazzling with fullness, but you can't keep a universe to yourself. Sometimes you have to return a gentle planet to its shelf. Not because you were too greedy, but because tenderness is not for sale. It's early, so I tiptoe through my sins, not because I'm thoughtful of others sleeping, but because 
I wouldn't mind living in a world with two moons. I wouldn't mind slipping a few satellites into my pocket instead of a life with lunar, limited lunar events. Tenderness is wholesale and it wants me to pull it from the shelf. Tenderness has a voice box. Tenderness keeps saying, close your eyes, close your eyes. Tenderness will not turn off. And I think I'm going to end on, gosh, do we end on a poem with someone's head on my thigh or a sleeping poem with the dream? I think we're going to do the sleeping poem um, because I just read a poem um, that mentioned sleeping and dreaming. I think I did. Um. It's always interesting where poems come from. Uh, sometimes when I go back and I'm reading this book, it's like you're reading an, an old part of yourself. Like when you go back to your old poems and sometimes you don't remember what made you write that poem. But this poem was one where I was trying to imagine what it would be like if I could enter a lover's dream and just kind of walk around and see what was going on in there. Cause I'm curious like that. I'm the person who walks around at night and looks into people's this. It sounds creepier than it is, but you know how you, they have their lights on and you can see people living their life. I find it fascinating just to see people sitting and talking on a cell phone or um, reading a book or doing the dishes. It's like, we all have these little places we live in this whole other lives that we don't know about. So um it's a curiosity, not a perversion. It sounds like it might be something more. I'm just curious of everyone's mind. This poem's called, One Day I'd Like to Live in a World Without Alarm Clocks. Last night, I wrote you a letter between the scars on your body, like sketching light between what was once pain. And when I was done, I signed my name on your thigh, autographed copy. I thought, but at this point, you were asleep and dreaming of another another artist. Someone's hands on your body, or maybe because I heard your stomach rumble when I was writing my favorite line about a constellation across your abdomen. I wondered whether your dream had descended into the kitchen to the plate of scrambled eggs and green onions I left out. And when you went to grab a napkin, you realized it was covered in pen marks and you wondered how to wipe your face without a lightning bolt of blue across your lips. And this is when I love you most, when you are covered in my smeared words. And when I fell asleep beside you, I tried to enter your dream by knocking on the kitchen window. Don't wake up. I have the strawberries I picked from our garden. I am holding the three stars we always talk about, and they are not even burning my palm. Thank you. Hey, Kelly, those are terrific. Wow. I, you know, if you could introduce uh, Katrina, that would be so terrific. And talk a little bit about her poems and, and why you selected them and that, that kind of thing. That would be terrific. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Katrina Canyon, I met her due to the pandemic and she runs an amazing, uh, reading series online called Canyon Writers. And, um, she invited me to it. And here was this amazing, rich community of poets with so much love and support for each other. 
um, it immediately made me interested in, in her work um, and what she brings to the world. And so when Danny asked me who I would choose, she immediately came to mind because I always want to share the people who are the lights in the world, the people that continue to create this rich literary community. And so she was an easy choice. And I was just so happy when she said yes. So Katrina, add anything you would like to that. I don't think I can. That was so nice. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's an honor to have been chosen by you. And I have enjoyed every moment that I've known you. You've been a light yourself and an inspiration. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I think I'm going, I'm going to start with the poem that's in Plume, and it is called Craving. I want you to crave me as you crave caffeine the first thing in the morning after a hard night's sleep. I don't know what it means to be wanted like that. I just know what it means to want, to desire, to be hungry. I sketch my world in pencil so that I can erase it if it doesn't please you. Yet yours is indelible. I memorize every word, every mood of your face and trace them along the nerves of my spine to learn what pleases you. I have done this for so long, I forget what pleases me. All that I taste between my lips is bitterness. I blame myself more than you. My world is fi just filled with gray smudges now. I have to find a way to start over. Use a new shade of sheet of paper, maybe, and a fine pen, maybe a Mont Blanc. I think I might like that. And now I'm going to read something from my uh, book, Surviving Home which is new. I, unfortunately, I don't have a sticker yet, but <laughs> hopefully one day. This one is called Thoracic Biology. For the most part, I want to learn to let go, to hurt a little less. My heart is what hurts the most. Where did I learn to breathe through the pain, to cut off the sword piercing through my left lung? I think it was the woman who taught me to read, who taught me to understand the language. Or maybe it was the man who pressed the hot scalpel of innuendo against my skin. The chambers of the heart are made in heads. Getting through is what I consider making love. Not that I've had many lovers, more through my head than my heart. Last night, I dreamed of sex in a bed made of quicksand where I furrowed and sank in undulating beats. I loved the way I was surrounded by obsidian, the heat, the magma that ran through my aortic arch, the holding on, the seizing, the pain. Most times when I sleep, I dream of my hands clutched tight around something I cannot see and I cannot let go. And then I'll do one last one. This one is called Genesis. Eve traded her beauty for brains when she sank her teeth into the apple. She tasted knowledge of good and evil, and she let the juice roll down her neck in between her breasts. She bid Adam to kiss her cervix. Taste what you will know, what God hid from us, she demanded. We were taught that desire began with the first bite, but it was actually the first kiss, the taste of the sweet fruit, her nectar against his lips. That was the beginning of it all. He tasted her and decided it was good. She gave up everything she had that day. She would get wrinkled, gain 10 pounds a year, and lose every tooth in her head. She would rather die then spend another moment in ignorance. That is being a woman. When Eve tasted the earth, she did not give us pain and death. Her gift to us was knowledge. 
the pain is part of the price we pay. And thank you again to everyone at Plume. I, I thank you, Kelly and Katrina. That's interesting. Both of you writing, you're both writing about desire and it's, it's great. <laughs> it's really interesting. And uh, Kelly, I was thinking about what you said about that desire to kind of, uh, you know, look into other people's lives. And, you know, I, I think maybe there's a voyeur in all of us. I certainly can recall uh, walking and loving to walk in the neighborhood at night and just, you know, just passing by people's lives and each and just wondering, you know, what, what they're having for dinner. Sounds like I didn't have any dinner at home, but I did, but <laughs> it always seemed more intriguing to look into someone else's window. <laughs> so thank you for both of these poems. And um, I'd like to introduce Martha Rhodes. I've known her for many, many decades. And, uh, and I know that she's a terrific poet. We both were at Warren Wilson together where she now teaches in the MFA program. And I know she's a marvelous editor. And she's a wonderful friend, and it's a big thrill to be introducing Martha. Her latest book is uh, The Thin Wall, and I, I think this poem is very interesting, too, in terms of, um, well, you'll hear her read the poem that's in Plume and others, but uh, thank you, Martha. Thank you for all that you do as a citizen, poet citizen of the world, your generosity to other writers, and especially here to us at Plume. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. It's torture not to be able to be in the same room with you. And um, it's been too long, but we will make it down to Maryland. Um, I'm and thank you, Danny and everyone at Plume, Amanda, Zach um, and others. Um, I'm going to read from uh, a manuscript that I've been working on for a while and uh, the poem from Plume is uh, in this manuscript that's in progress. Um, and I'm not going to announce which poem it is because I want you all to go and um, buy a copy of Plume and then you'll find it and others. Um, I'm being tricky here. So the first poem, uh, these are uh, persona poems. I hope to make that evident somehow as, as the book um, uh, progresses, but there's no static I. It's a very, 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 uh, the, the I varies. February stabbings. The cloud reachable and lowering pours cold and sharp on us. Then shifts east, I think, I think to see. A momentous event only we two notice. Or are we more? Or just me? Maybe not a cloud we breathe. Does this hovering rise from a revolt underfoot? A gaseous molten mist that fills our lungs with confusion and seems a cloud, but is not? Such disorientation. And we lose sight of it, await the next drench. We're foolish this way, ridiculous, blowing warmth onto each other, a little comfort while exposed to these harsh February stabbings. The rage will return for us if we continue our wait. We will. We'll stand here anticipating, not quite dreading the next eruption, looking for the icy missiles, and in summer too, looking for those heated explosions. Our storms remind us that we are targeted and must never forget we're aimed at, punished, punctured, though sometimes gently storm-kissed while never knowing why. We, who've only met here in Rockland, and there on Plum Island, and Nantasket, and also at that thin iced mud puddle crackling brownly over the soggy lawn of our deepest, dreamiest dreams. We always meet as if for the first time, our names unknown to each other, no matter, so much unknown, 
colors of eyes, alto or soprano, and if we will continue meeting, and if we are a we at all, and if so, wherein do we live, and which is me? Seen through glass, the eyelash magnified, also sperm, swimming like all of us, I thought, I thought nowhere, hamsters on a wheel. Husband's seed speeding away from me. I saw the barrenness of my future when at that time, even the word my, coupled with daughter, son, house, plate, headache, my, over and over again, was plunged scalpel sharp into the heart by well-intentioned friends, as in, my Ben turns 10 today, sending me to the inner skull's roof, a cliff to leap from. Yes, until I suppose after decades, I just became deaf and to and by the word. And when I look at the world through the glass of the microscope on the loved one's curious desk to discover what the dampness of a paper towel reveals, my mind is flat as a jellyfish fried on Miami beach sand. I was once there with parents in the 60s, wealthy enough for the Eden, its Shirley temples and umbrellaed virgin drinks all for me. And that wondrously glorious pool, empty at noon, save for father, who we all watched through the surprising glass wall at our first buffet there, along with other guests pointing laughing, then ready to harpoon him as he, oblivious, pulled off his trunks and performed that underwater dance. A few teens jumped in, saw, and raced away from the excited milky water. I'm imagining that detail. What brings me to the microscope today? Certainly not sperm. Peanut butter smeared, just peanut butter. Drop of diseased blood, white cells unreadable to me. A dead cat's whisker retrieved from safekeeping. Dull, perhaps. I never see anything more than what's evident. Unsoft. From the beginning, that was only my beginning. I don't presume it was anyone else's. I was difficult. No one came forward to nurse or clean me. Ashamed to look away, they could not look at, for I was, if not horned and befouled, repugnant, reminding them of the ever-suppressed collective nightmare. Even in their most naked moments, barely awake before coffee and eggs, dawn just beginning to melt the crust at their eyes, they heard my squalls and pretended I was yet to arrive into their lives. I was still just a swelling for those few moments, a happy promise. From the beginning, I was demanding and insatiable. I ate through carpet, pearls, quilts, and pets. I demolished bank accounts and shat out snakeheads. I was, I remember, a beast, unsoft, rancid, my milk teeth pointing in all directions. I was at home in their root cellar, hayloft, dung pile, pig slot bucket, called scarecrow, gaseous, fungal spread. I'm not self-loathing here. I do not ask to be convinced otherwise. My sisters knew I belonged townships away. At the lodge, send it to the lodge, they'd pray through their sheets. But I'd made that impossible, having snuck through the portal to smear my waist on those walls and across the sleeping foreheads of its occupants, my signature. You see, I wanted to stay with my family, my loved ones. And yet it was I who buried them year by year, there is no why, save that from my beginning, I was difficult. If only it wasn't so difficult to smother a difficulty I'd hear through my crib seat sheets. Night after night, nap after nap, I tried to make it easy for them, rising up again and again to meet the pillows held above my head. The 
the way out is to forget you haven't a sense of direction, that you walk circles to find your own kitchen in your own dear house. The way out then is to look down at your feet and command them to shuffle forward and to be patient for the moment the moon's pull will fully take over for you. You will look down to see a puddle of black dressed mourners become a smudge, weeping less it is clear to you for your goneness than for themselves. You know this now that you have finally found the way out and you even understand why for many, really for most, you barely wept. The tears there were being for your own life circlings, closer to that moon, if not beyond. Embraced. I have visited an ancient redwood and heard it creak as I've rested my cheek and ear against its trunk. It has received my deepest sobs and my hundreds of fingerings along its soft bark. Leaning into it, I have whispered to my most darling ones, mother, Lucy, my multicolored cats, as if they've coursed through the tree's vascular system to form an inner stream, their happy noise so audible. I've stopped at the tree for hours over years in the shadow of Mount Tam, and I've napped at tree's base, inebriated by the moldy dew of its memories, boiled up, to commingle with the mist of my breathings so that I must slow, resist rushing past, to recall the paddings of creatures before, as well as my own over years. I always like to pretend the tree has fashioned a thick, fresh bed of fallen needles, especially for me. Today, as I walk the loop around Bon Tempe Lake, I hear the loud and familiar hello from the tree its creek long, bent like and old. I know the tree has ushered me back to remind me that it has, in particular, missed me. The tree wants to know where I've been these past 11 years and where I wish to go and where I think I will go. I'm gonna stop there and just say a, a little bit about uh, Rushi and how I came across his work. Um, through an open reading period at Four Way Books, where we received many, 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 many manuscripts, and um, I think, <laughs> I think basically by the first sentence, I was like, "Here it is," <laughs> and of course, kept reading and reading and reading, and that was just a very exciting time. And you know, we we get so many great manuscripts, and and um, as I know you all understand, we just can't take them all. What I love um, in particular about Rushi's work is that, yeah, the content is really compelling. It is very compelling content. Um, but, you know, the delivery, the way, the way he, he, um, he shapes the poem and all the elements that go into making the poem from his lexical decisions, the imagery, the, the seeing the, the, the lineation, all of those craft decisions that he's made are just so damn intelligent and um, exciting to behold. And um, that's what excites me because really, you know, we're human beings, we're kind of limited in what we, we write about. I mean, there might be a thousand subjects, but there aren't as many subjects as there are in the stars, but you know, uh, stars in the sky, but you know what? There are as many ways to treat those subjects as there are stars in the sky. And um, Rushi's work just got under my skin and it got under um, Team Four Ways skins, skins. That sounds a little weird. Um, and I'm delighted to, you know, Danny, this was a great idea. I'm just so happy to have been able to um, help usher um, Rushi's work into the Plume Anthology and to read with him today. Uh -oh. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, good. Um, wow. Um, yeah, thank you, Martha, um, for inviting me to be part of this anthology, of course, for um, accepting my manuscript and, and uh, the book's coming out in March. Um, 
so grateful to be reading alongside you and Kelly and Katrina and um, uh, thankful to the Plume team. Um, this is a gorgeous book. I've been just like opening it up to a different page, you know, on, on different days and just surprised and just delighted by the idea. Um, yeah. To, to see these poets in conversation. Um, I'm going to read um, three poems from when I reach for your pulse um, and um, go from there. The middle poem will be the one that's, that you'll find in Plume. I won't be too mysterious like Martha on that, but you should buy the book for sure. Okay. Double slit. On the tongue, dim hovering over basement cement. Light scatters gray to the transom above my dead father. Stiff as sugar cane, I stand. Golden beams fleck grains of dust into his mouth. Light molds an ejected tongue into a tumor. My metastatic tremble. No. Think of light. My body approaching. Now wave. His hanging. Now particle. When I reach for his pulse, I collapse. Behind the door's double slit, the suspended body dies when seen. Perhaps if I look away, no. Two days earlier, in sunlight, in the car, my bapu closer to my throat than his mind, one moment shaking, cursing his goddamn son. The next, still apology. Open palm caressing his butt shoes, flat head. The visible spectrum flutters in rear view. No. Blink, phantasm, flicker, shadow, quiver. Basement furnace burning behind the neck, thieving his body to warm our home. I offer prasad to the mercy of his mangled tongue, pour milk past hungry mouth into the gutter. Across the globe, a monk leaps from a mountain to return as rain. The prayer's scaffold falls. This next poem is called um, Midwest Physics, Third Law, and you'll find it in the book. At the Bob Evans on Harvest Lane, Bapu ordered his Western omelet, no ham. And I told him I was dropping out of medical school, foreclosing on my debt. My country teaches for any refusal, retaliation. On the ride home from school after 9-11, a white man flipped us off. Our evasion we are Hindu. How Brahmin the slide step. How American the elision. Perhaps these laws stretch beyond borders undetained. Perhaps we're pulled like waves by an unseen mass in day and light is never swallowed by dark, but only grappling with its refusal. Bapu's fork scraped the plate. A jay alighted on a power line beside a pair of red sneakers swaying under the noose someone tied of their laces. Under the moon and May's blue sky, I swirled pancake in the maple's blood. Bapu tried and failed to say, all my hard work for you to become a bum. Now that he is gone, what's my equal and opposing force? For each omission between us, dear father, dear country, what's the word? For every noose, someone must cut the thread. And um, I'm here today with a bit of a heaviness 
heaviness in the heart. Um, a student of mine, tragically this week, um, from my advanced creative writing class here, um, passed away at the age of 20. And um, yeah, it's been a hard time. Um, and I had the chance to meet with some of her friends and just hear about, she was such a talented writer, um, wrote with such intellect and wit and um, saw that she was such a force of optimism within her peers in the theater and writing communities. So this poem is for the memory of Sophie Turley and her friends will be grieving. New definition of blues after Mississippi John Hurt. Does a stone gifted movement give a damn about anything meaning anything? Would a sparrow tired of singing the same song day after day bark if given the choice? Like you, these are not questions for no reason. The breeze tastes rose milk and the evening sounds, cars, leaves, friction, occasional passers-by smooth into and out of the same drone. I'm all ears, a bag of tortellini filled with paneer. In the humid air, warm as curdled milk, my shoulders loosen as a dog growls as the sparrow stomps in a puddle before the bird flies to pick my shells. World, have me. As long as wings unfurl and taunt, I'll keep scratching at the bark until I'm gone. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Wow. These are uh, just absolutely amazing and terrific. Um, it just seems that we're kind of um, on this pendulum between wonder and dread. I don't know. It's very, very. Um, wow. Thank you, Martha. Those are incredible. Rushi, amazing. And I'm just thinking we have a little bit of time here. What do you think, Danny? Can they each read one more if they've got one? I would love that. Just more. <laughs> so starting maybe with Kelly Russell. Hang on. If you could read one, if you've got one handy, just we could just go through and just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's another desire one. Um, and I have to say absence, which is a hard word for me to say, but I get it out of the way in the title. Um, and for anyone that's ever been in a long term relationship, um, maybe something in here will speak to you. It's called Modern Love with Absence. As I dissolve the sugar cube in my drink, there's a comma in the sky. My hips sway across the beach, your body, a sign, a sigh. Lifeguard not on duty. You and I are close again. I eat the lemon cake, you do the dishes. I undress, you undress me. We are strange tides of living, a sentence of years where half of what I tell you is true. But we've sipped a marriage on that, the sweet dissolving in darkness. Yes, all that bitterness is hard to love, but I'm thankful for the precision of your fingers, the ability to unfasten me from the lace of decades holding me in. Thank you. Hey, Nancy. Hey there. Can I just jump in and just let everyone know that in the chat section, there are links to everyone's books um, and in Rushi's case, his website. Um, and I know, uh, Rushi, your, your book is coming out in uh, March 2023. Uh, so there's but there's a link to your website for that. And then also for the Plume Anthology. So. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, because I, you know, probably wouldn't have been able to go negotiate both of these. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, 
Gosh, Katrina, do you have another one for us that uh, we can wrap up with? Sure. Let's see here. It's a little racy. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. okay. Anecdote of life. My sex hides in wordplay. It dances between lines and billowing beats. My sex buries itself, its vulva underneath metaphors and between similes. It holds its desires on top of stanzas and underneath syllabic verse. My sex inhales blank verse like it's opium and floats on a spectrum of calligrams. My sex is not defined by the heft of the chest or what's physically between the thighs. My sex is defined by the mind and the words that flow from the ego. <clears throat> it is the alliteration that runs my heartbeat. It is the haiku that straightens my spine, the rhyme that tickles my inner thighs. Sonnets throb in me in couplets and float down to my feet on pantoums. It is lyric verse that rams deep within me to make me moan. My sex is poetry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you there. Gosh, <laughs> we have Eros and Thanatos <laughs> hand in hand here. This is terrific stuff. Martha, I hope you have one more for us. Uh, sure. This is a poem that uh, was in an earlier um an earlier poem thank you danny very much for that um and it's called joanna's eye four of us followed our faster friend who was already up our oak her main coon climbing to higher than that than that hanging mosquito-filled bat we pointed to from below, where jeweled weeds shot high, tickling and stinging our thighs. A bit to our left, there he was, naked and crouching in the shade at just about 10 o'clock, thinking himself unseen or knowing himself seen, his hand busy where it was, his tongue panting, as our worlds at once unsteadied, the cat hissed at the snap of a tender branch. Our friend fell onto her jackknife, and her left eye, lost forever, became, we begged her to let us play with it, a green-flecked marble. I love that poem, Martha. I, I'm so glad I got to hear you read it. Yeah, that's amazing. Hmm. Uh, Roshi, do you have one for us to wrap up with? Yeah, just um, a short one here. Um, Ars Poetica. The coach wanted me to run faster, like a husky, and so tied me to his. My legs only choice, one between fall and flight. Like this, the dog taught me how flesh may stretch beyond itself. Like this, I ran and ran and ran wherever willed the animal. Thank you. Wow. Uh, wow. So, I gosh. Well, this uh, certainly has been an hour of amazement, and it makes reminds me of why we all do this, uh, why we all do this and read this and have uh, dedicated ourselves to this art. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really, uh, it's amazing. I don't know if anyone has a few things to say before we sign off. We've got uh, seven minutes, but I don't know if any if, um, by anyone has a, a few things to say before we 
wrap this up. I just know that you've energized me and brought me back. I was, uh, I wasn't sure where uh, I was in this swirling crazy world, but when I'm here with you all, I do know where I am and I really appreciate that. Thank you for this centering. Danny, would you like to say a few words of. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it's so odd to think that I'm able to be here with you. Um, Plume began it with such a nothing. I just sort of thought, oh, I'll last a couple of issues. And it's become more than 10 years now. And Nancy and Amanda have been with me. We have been together for quite a while. And Leah, now we have a staff. I think when we began, there was no staff for the first few years. Um, but I'm just very, very grateful to all of the poets and all of the staff for being so kind and so generous. Um, thank you. I can't imagine why you've done this, but thank you. And thank you, Danny. I saw that quick little evil eye of my calling you back again. Like, why? <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, it was a, it, I don't know about you all, but it certainly was a tonic. Uh, yeah, I don't, I think I'll stay off the news. Um, maybe watch some crazy little French movie. <laughs> ah, thank, thank you, Nancy. And thank you for your gracious hosting. And thank you to all the readers. It's wonderful to be part of the community here. So thank you all. Thank you thank so you. much. And thank you from the Writer Center for all of you for joining us here virtually. And uh, we hope we'll see you at some stuff again in the future. And we have another plume coming up, uh, another plume event coming up in December, if I'm recalling correctly. December 3rd. All right. Uh, and we'll get the, uh, if you're on the, if you've got an invitation day, you'll get an invitation uh, to that one as well. So we hope to see you in the next one. Thank you, Zach. Thank you very, very much for hosting us and see you all soon. <laughs>